Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Wow. We had a phenomenal time. Where's our men at again? Where are you at? There you are. Come on, man. We got rocked. It was amazing. And uh, just an honor to be with the men of this house and just so blessed by this house and who you are and what you're pushing in for. Um, it's, it's such an honor. And um, my name is Corey Russell and uh, I'm from Northwest Arkansas. Actually, my dad's side of the family comes from Clarksville. My uh, grandfather was a part of the 101st Airborne out of uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and always felt such a dear, we'd always come do family uh, holidays here in the Nashville region and uh, just love this city and love the purposes of God over this city. Um, carry it deep in my heart. And so um, I'm, I'm from Arkansas. You're going to hear a Southern accent and it's a very powerful accent and it'll change your life. Um, <laughs> come on, <let's> <laughs> All right. Uh, things are awesome. All right. I got radically saved in uh, 1997 in a college parking lot in Fort Smith, Arkansas, gone as about as far as you can go into this world as the, the drugs, sex, and rap. I uh, didn't get into rock and roll, roll, it was rap. This eight-year-old white kid got into gangster rap music. I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but it happened. And that was really before we knew the full de deadliness of what that was doing to a culture. So by the time, you know, the first joint comes my way, I'm like, let's roll and everything else that came with it. And uh, kind of went through high school that way and was all into athletics. I, I can totally, you know, feel what uh, Pastor Henry's saying as far as not being able to do a lot of camping. Had a great dad, but all I did was play sports. We never really went camping. And so I don't really know what to do with that, but I'll find a hotel anywhere near. Um, it's my second joke. I got two more. I'll tell you when they are. <laughs> all right, good. Um, got radically saved. Uh, my best friend, mom, my best friend that I was running with, you know, she's one of them Pentecostal praying mamas that just anoints everybody with oil. Um, you know, always back then we didn't have the, uh, you know, the diffusers. We just had candles. Um, and so uh, 25 candles, almost going to burn the house down. And these women never sleep. And uh, I would come to his house high as a kite, just looking for a bed. She'd be waiting at the door three in the morning, just praying in the spirit, just anointing the house as I'm walking in saying, Corey, you can come in, but you leave those friends. Talk about demons outside. I'd stay at his house, lay my head on the pillow and, and I'd go, what in the world? She put anointing oil all over the pillows. <laughs> now I know there's some, we don't want, I know Timmy sat next to you. Some of y'all got them prayer cloths underneath Timmy's bed right now. Just wink at me if it's you. Because <laughs> Timmy sat next to you, so we don't want him checking underneath his, his cushions or anything like that. Um, <laughs> if his name's Timmy, then hello. Um, all right, turn to Luke 10. I got radical. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story, but go ahead and turn to Luke 10. I'm going to tell it quick. Uh, when you got to pray, so... He grew up in that kind of family, you know, about six or seven kids in the family. It kind of comes with that territory as well. Um, he, hit, he was homeschooled till ninth grade, goes crazy in uh, rebellion. We're partying hard. She's storming the gates of heaven and hell. And you know, it's T minus 10 until you come to Jesus. And so when you got a mama like that releasing the hounds of heaven to come after you and to hunt you down and disrupt everything, partying isn't as fun when you got a praying mom like that. And so uh, my friend went through about a four month season where he stopped talking and he was just weird. And it culminated on February 1st, 1997. And I showed up at his house another day to hang out with him. He comes running out the front door screaming at me. It's heaven or hell, Corey, it's heaven or hell. You have to make a decision right now and give your life to Jesus. And so he gets saved, I get angry. You don't get saved at 20, you get saved at 30. And so two weeks later, he showed up to college. I was still studying to be an elementary teacher. I mean, thank God the Lord intervened. <laughs> that 
last, last thing your little Timmy needed was me in a classroom. <laughs> and so, and so he takes me to lunch, says he was seeing things in the spirit and the voice of the Lord encountered his life. He said, give your life to Jesus. I said, no. He drove back to the college. I'm about to get out of the van. And I felt a presence I had never felt before. Holy Spirit filled the van. And before I knew it, I'm shaking violently like I'm having a seizure. He pulls in the back of the parking lot. He starts going after every spirit he can think of. I start choking and I knew I had to get out the name Jesus, but all I could get out was G's. And so I kept trying to say it. I go, G's, G's, G's. He said in my ear, say it, say it, say it. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm, we're talking. I go, I'm trying, I'm, tr I'm trying. <laughs> And finally, took a deep breath and screamed, Jesus, hold broke off of me. God came and breathed into my mouth. Come on. All I could say, he jumps out of the van dancing, running around the van saying, Jericho's come down. Jericho's come down. I didn't know what Jericho was. It sounded intense. <laughs> and so... I hear a voice as clear as day coming to my mind saying, get out of the van, get on the pavement, give me your life, your mind. That was February 18th, 1997. I jump out and I scream, Jesus, I give you my life, I'm yours. In that moment, I passed from death to life. I was delivered of all the drugs, all the stuff in one touch of the raw presence of God. Amen. <clears throat> I, am, I believe in the power of, the, of God. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to set free whatever addiction, whatever bondage, whatever thing is going on in your life, I believe in the power of God. And within a month, we had a drug ring of friends that had encounters like that or bigger in their explosions. Half the high school came to Jesus and our first six months were five meetings a week till three in the morning. And I began to gravitate to my best friend's mom and her friends. And that's who I hung out with. And I said, girls, give me the anointing oil. Teach me how to pray in the Holy Ghost. And I go, they taught me about prayer. They go, you don't need your favorite song on before you start praying. You got Bible in the tongues. Let's go after God. Got wrecked by God and been married to my wife. We got in August will be 25 years we've been married. Come on. Had our first daughter in 99. And then we, I brought my, my second daughter here. She's with me today. So I'm just surrounded. I got three daughters. They're awesome. They're going to change the world. They're powerful. Amen. I want to talk to you about the person that has changed my life more than anybody outside of Jesus. And I'm going to talk about a woman. Okay. We're going to talk about a woman in the Bible. She's only referenced three times in scripture. She only said one phrase, and I'm trying to make a point by saying this, yet every time we see her, she's at the feet of Jesus. There will be people that will have bigger ministries than her, that will do a lot more than her, but yet the thing she did, Jesus always defended her and called all of us to emulate her. And I really feel like a word from Mary of Bethany is a word for the church in America in this hour. The church in America that's all about bigger, better, greater, the seemingly productive needs a course adjustment to prioritizing a life at his feet like Mary of Bethany gave us. And I really feel like it's important for these days. I want to look briefly at the three pictures of Mary of Bethany in scripture and pull all three together just you know, debriefing with uh, Pastor Henry that he spoke on this a few weeks back, probably out of Luke 10, maybe pulled them all together. I want you to go with me to Luke 10 and I, and I wanna see this, this story and walk this through with you. All right, you with me? Yes. Say, I'm with you. Yes. Okay, you're about to get your life changed. Here we go. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Okay, Bethany's about two miles away from Jerusalem. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Okay, every time you see her, she's gonna be at his feet. She heard his word, but Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. Say much serving. 
Okay, I'm gonna give you four words to repeat. Those are the first two. Distracted and much serving, and she's bold. And she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to get off her lazy behind and help me. That's the CKJV, Corey King James Version. (laughs) She's agitated and she's bold and she's questioning Jesus's empathy and fairness. And she said, are you just gonna let her sit there and listen to you instead of helping me? And Jesus is gonna say something very profound and he's gonna say to her in a very endearing way. He's not angry or agitated. It's loving as he's gonna release a loving rebuke and course adjustment to Martha that I believe characterizes many in the body of Christ in America. That is, has a lot of things going on. And he says, Martha, Martha, look at this. Here's the second phrase. Everybody say worried. Worried. Everybody say troubled. troubled. So you got distracted, much serving, worried and troubled about many things. But then he says the phrase, one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Here's my call and and I believe, and I'm going to summarize Mary's life. I'm gonna take you to the school of prayer today. And I call the first season of Mary and this season, this lesson is kindergarten through fifth grade. The next story we look at will be sixth grade to 12th grade. And the last story, will be your college and on into doctoral studies of growing in your life of prayer. The first lesson, if you're going to begin to cultivate a life of prayer on a consistent basis in your home, in your workplace, wherever you're at, is by learning how to come out of the swirl. Learning how to come out of the busyness around Jesus and begin to discover the glory at the feet of Jesus. Here's a question I have for you. How good of a receiver are you? Prayer does not begin with you talking, but with you listening. And most of us, I believe Jesus wants to rip up your prayer list. I believe he wants to rip up your prayer list and he wants to begin to get you to look at him and listen to him and to hear his word. That's what Mary is doing in Luke 10. She's at the feet of Jesus and the words coming out of his mouth is marking her, is washing her, and is filling her because Mary makes a bold, courageous stance right here. She said, the son of God is in my house. The creator of the universe is in my house and I refuse to just get busy. Friends, it can happen in the workplace. It can happen in your jobs, your family, little Timmy's at soccer four nights a week. You've got all the stuff going on and it's even more in the church, on staff and in ministry and in all the stuff we're doing, all the stuff around Jesus, but never connecting with Jesus. And Mary breaks a box. And this is, this is what we need. Your first lesson in prayer is getting delivered from the expectation of others. If you're going to develop a deep, consistent life of prayer, you're going to offend people close to you. People that don't understand the value at the feet of Jesus. It's gonna require a radical breaking. It's gonna cause some of you to wake up earlier, others to stay up later others to create spaces and time that no amount of opportunity or mistreatment and betrayal can get you out of. What if we saw the hour with Jesus every day as the most important hour of our 24 hours? What if you saw that time at his feet? You're like, I don't have an hour. I bet you do, but I'll go ahead and meet you at it. Give him 30, give him 20. A time where you shut down and you open your Bible and you don't just tell him the stuff you need, but you let him mark your heart with his word. Nobody likes being in any relationship where one person talks the whole time. Do you? No, after a while, we, we kind of get away from those people. 
We know how to shield ourselves and create brief moments. <laughs> awesome, I gotta go. <laughs> now, if, it's, if I'm touching marriage issues today, that's a whole nother thing, man. Y'all don't do that, listen, all right? Mary makes a radical choice and she lets Jesus fight her battles. She's gonna let Jesus defend her. She's gonna let Jesus fight her battle and all she's gonna do is listen. See, this is the issue, and I need you to hear this next statement. Mary made the choice that the words coming out of his mouth is going to be the primary source of identity. I, I, I've got something to say to you. You're either gonna find it by what he says over you as his beloved son and daughter, or what you do for him. If you pro find your primary source of identity by what you do for him, you'll do it for a little while. You'll serve the husband, serve the wife, serve the kids, serve the church. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's all for Jesus. It's all for Jesus until someone doesn't notice you. Until someone who comes in after you gets elevated above you. Until nobody touches you or says anything to you because you're just serving the Lord. See, this is the point. If you're getting your primary source of identity from pastors noticing you, you'll put in your time for a season, but after a while, anger will start bubbling. Frustration will start bubbling. You'll call it a new season. You'll call it, I've got that going on or this going on. At the end of the day, you didn't get noticed because that's your primary source of identity. And I'm talking about serving at home. Wives serving your husbands, husbands serving your families. If you're not getting it from God and they're not really good at giving it, there's gonna come a time where it's gonna crack through and you're gonna demand it. You hear me? You better get defined by what he says because people are fickle and you're not always gonna get it. Jesus looks at Martha and goes, honey, I love you, but you are so consumed with many things. The care, you are so consumed with Swirlville, you constantly live in Swirlville. Emotions, emotions, emotions. Mary, is, he goes this, one thing is needed. Because this is crazy, Jesus, get practical. Not one thing's needed, we got mortgage, we got jobs, we got kids, we got Timmy and soccer. He goes, no, you need to understand, if you get this one thing right in your life, hear me guys, it doesn't take smart people, gifted people, rich people, all it takes is folk who hear the one thing. One thing is needed. Which means this, if you get this one thing right in your life, it will set a trajectory for 10 other things to align in your life. I feel like we're doing a disservice to you of just trying to teach us to deal with the 10 other things. We'll fix the marriage, fix the kids, fix the money, fix the da, 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 da. But guess what? If there is not the one thing in place, you're gonna keep bearing the same fruit every season. If you go after one thing, you get everything. If you go after everything, you get nothing. Mary chose. I can't make that choice for you. Pastors can't make that choice for you. And it will never be taken away from her. What does that mean? She just sowed the most glorious commodity called time into eternity. And it will live forever. I really believe it's important for the church right now. I need everybody to hear me. I really believe it's important for you in this hour because guys, this is as easy of days as it's gonna get is right now. You are in the 2.0 on the treadmill. And if you're worn out, friends, I want you to know that there comes days of trouble to your life. There comes intense seasons. Matthew 7 says there's seasons when rains come, winds blow and floods hit to where it's going to expose what your reality is. And if you don't cultivate a secret life at the feet of Jesus, where his word is the predominant conversation, that will get exposed in another season. 
I can fake you out now and hallelujah and move in my gifts. But if I don't have secret history, there will come seasons that will expose it. And Mary chose the good part and we're gonna see how it's going to play on into the next season. Go with me to John 11, John 11. This is the second time we're going to see Mary of Bethany and we're gonna get introduced to her older brother named Lazarus. We're gonna find out that Mary and Martha have a brother, his name is Lazarus, and this is the seasons. And guys, I need you to understand this. There are seasons of great difficulty, of loss, of trial, where it doesn't go like what you thought it was gonna go like. God is faithful, but I'm here to tell you, it's gonna look different than what you imagine. And so many of us get offended when we make an idol of our fantasies. When we make an idol of what we think it's going to look like, because we hear glory to glory and we don't see death to resurrection. It's death to resurrection. And this is the way of the kingdom. This is the way of the kingdom. I love it. Matthew 16, Jesus said, hey, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Boom. Good job, Peter. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. Gates of hell won't prevail. Hallelujah. Peter's feeling good. Abba just spoke through him. And from that time, Jesus began to show them how he has to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And Peter just got that one right. So he's feeling good. Hey, Jesus. We can get you to your destiny without suffering. Jesus doesn't give him a hug. He goes, ah, you little off, buddy. He goes, no, you know how Abba was just talking through you? Now Satan's talking through you. Get behind me, Satan. You are mindful of the things of men and not of the things of God. And Satan, a satanic uh, assault is to get you to your destiny without a cross. Jesus didn't just do it for you. He did it as your example. That's what first Peter tells us. He's not just the atoning one for us. This is our journey into life. And yet we do everything to barricade ourselves from it. But yet this is to know him and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of sufferings. So they're about to go through a season right here of great loss and pain. I need you with me. Are you with me? Come on, 12 more minutes. Here we go. Let's roll. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. I love this. It was that Mary. Everybody say that Mary which anointed Jesus with the fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. John is going to introduce something about Mary that we won't see till chapter 12. Which begs the question, why are you connecting us with that Mary? I, this is a personal inference here. I believe it's because John is saying Mary had to walk through John 11 to get to John 12. Mary had to walk through crushing seasons to produce the oil that she would lavish on Jesus in a future season. Many of you are, a, guys, God will use crushing to produce oil. That's what Gethsemane is. It's the olive press. And God will use crushing seasons to produce a new worship, a new prayer, a new love, a new sacrifice that you will lavish on him in a future season and it's getting worked in the divine delay seasons. All right, you with me? So they, they, they got a brother sick and then, so they send a letter to Jesus and they go, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Okay, he loves him, let's keep going. And then it says this, it says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God that the son of God may be glorified through it. That's one of the greatest statements of Jesus in the whole gospels. He gets the letter and he goes, this is not going to end in death. He didn't say he wouldn't die. He just said it's not going to end in death. But God, the son of God is going to get glory through this situation. God's going to get glory through this situation. So we would think, let's keep reading. It says Jesus loved Martha. 
okay? He loved Mary and he loved Lazarus. So the natural way that in America in 2023, verse six, we would insert would be, so Jesus immediately translated to Bethany, laid hands on Lazarus, got up, and they had a party. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says so that when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days where he was. I thought love immediately fixes the situation. What does it look like? Because that's what Jesus did. You know the Roman centurion? Hey, my servant's at home. Jesus goes, I'll come and heal. Oh, you don't have to. He spoke a word and he was healed. Countless strangers, countless sinners were touched by the power of Jesus immediately. They didn't have to go through a waiting process. They didn't have to go through a delay. They didn't have to go through death. Boom. You got it. Why is John keep emphasizing the fact that he loved them and he's not immediately answering the situation? I need some of you to know that if you're in a divine delay season where there are promises and there are deep things on the inside of you you have not seen the answer to and maybe parts of it has died. Maybe there's a death that's gone on, the sickness in a situation that you have pled with God to answer and it's almost like there's a brass heavens and he's not immediately answering the situation. I just want you to know you're in good company. I want you to know it's not a statement of his of, of him not loving you. He loves you and he hears you. And I believe that the glory of God is going to be manifested through this whole situation. Just do not quit and let the season birth a new prayer on the inside of you. All right, keep going with me here. He says this, it says, so I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fast forward for the sake of time. Jesus is gonna wait two more days. And by the time Jesus gets to Bethany, it's four days late. Everybody say four days late. You're like, no brother, it's perfect timing. No, he's late. It's all in God's perfect timing. No, he's late. He's four days. Lazarus is in a tomb, rotting, stinking, and it's a really ugly sight. And in those four days, I need to talk to you about the four days. It's in these seasons. Who in here knows what I'm talking about? Divine delay seasons where it felt like God was late to the situation. Now we know theologically all the truths, but I don't care. You feel it. And the worst thing you can do is hide behind plastic phrases devoid of reality. In the four days, there's going to come two types of responses. There's either going to come Martha's response or Mary's response. It's either going to be one that is what I call plastic praying, because I need you to know faith is not about having all the right answers. Faith is not about checking it off your box, but about, but about letting God do a work on the inside of you to birth a new prayer of saying, I know who you are, but I don't know why you haven't gotten here. Are y'all with me? Talk to me then. All right, here we go. It says this, they came, he had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined women. Uh, go ahead and go to the next verse. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. This is how I picture this scene. Mary's sitting. Either she's lazy or she's learned something. Either she's lazy or, because she's always sitting. I'm going to think she's learned something. Many of us need to learn how to sit. Sit in tension. Sit in the unknown. Sit in trusting God when you don't see anything. And sitting in the tension. I picture it like this, Martha's pacing in the room. I know he got the letter, why didn't he get here on time? He's answered this, he did it for the centurion, he's done it for him, him, him. He loves us, we're tight, I served him. We're close. He doesn't love everybody, he loves us. <laughs> Why didn't he get here? And then it says, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, 
boom, she left. She immediately ran out to the edge of Bethany, stands face to face with Jesus, and look at what's gonna come out of her mouth. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Now Mary's gonna say the exact same verse, same prayer, 10 verses later, and she's gonna say it. Lord, if you would have gotten here on time, we would not be in this situation. So Martha's going to make what I believe is more of an accusation against Jesus saying, if you'd have been here, we wouldn't be in this mess. And then she's going to kick in to what I call, I can just hear the old B organ coming in, the organ kicking in, and she's gonna kick into what I call plastic praying. Lots of big language devoid of reality. Look at this. She goes, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Turn it on, organ guy. But even now, I know, look at this, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Hey. <laughs> whatever you ask of God, he'll give it to you. Hey. <laughs> Jesus pretty much tells the piano guy, shut it down. He looks her stone cold right in the face and he says this, not any emotion, your brother will rise again. All right, Oregon guy, get back going. And then she says this, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know. Everybody say, I know. I know. When someone says, I know, they don't know. <laughs> the very indictment you don't know is when you say you know. These aren't moments to be known, clean, cookie, a cookie, cookie cutter, fill in the blank, nice little theological boxes. I know, I got all the right theological truths. Organ, come in. I know that he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. That's good theology. That's beautiful theology. She believes in the resurrection of the dead. She believes the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up to the Lord to meet him in the air. She has right theology and Jesus is calling her to something deeper than just living on buzzwords, living in plastic phrases devoid of reality. He goes, I don't need your theological correctness right now. I'm not looking for your fill in the blank so you can walk around to all the people going, no, we're good. Marriage is falling apart. Oh, we're good. We're never been in a better season. No, no, brother, I know what's going on in your life. Talk to me. No, no, it's all perfect. And we hide behind the persona. We want to look beautiful to everybody, having it all together. And God releases seasons of death that break you out of the spirit of religion, that break you out of that, that, that plastic facade of pretty and nice and having it all together. And not only, and it's not at first with people, it's with God. It's not about you looking raw with people. It's about something breaking on the inside of you so you can break through your nice little theological walls and caverns that we live in and say, God, I need you. And I don't understand why you didn't get here. I need you to break into my marriage. My child needs a breakthrough. God, I need a breakthrough in our finances since that person betrayed us and took our money. Now here we got it all together. It's all good. And Jesus says, no, it ain't. Stop it. Jesus says it. Stop it. You can keep talking at this level. I'm going to keep talking to you here. When are you going to get here? She goes, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection. Jesus goes, honey, I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection isn't just coming, resurrection's here. And I'm looking for you to pull resurrection into your story. Pull resurrection into your story. It's not just coming, he's here. Don't resign it just for someday. Pull on it today. I am. He goes, do you believe this? And when Jesus asks a question, he's not looking for an answer. It's an interrogation. 
You don't believe this. Yes, Lord. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter just said that and got a blessing. She hit a wall with it. Right phrases, not moving Jesus. Right phrases, right prayers, perfect prayers. Polished prayers, plastic prayers. Plastic prayers. Perfect, polished, plastic. Where's ugly? Where's mascara flowing? Where's hair shaking? Where's ugly, guttural, crying? I need God. It's really hard for Americans who boast in our independent self-sufficiency, having it all together. That's below us. I'll go in million dollar of debt to show everybody around me we're doing good. Just to make the point, we're good. So it is with God, yet the poverty of spirit are the ones who access the kingdom of heaven. All right, she, they have their nice talk, go nowhere. Jesus still ain't left Bethany. He, he's still at the outside of Bethany saying, can I get one of y'all jokers to come out here and pray? All right, look at this. Go to the next verse. Here we go. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, the teacher has come and he's calling for you. Do you see Jesus ask for Mary? Do you see Jesus ask for Mary? What did Martha see in the eyes of Jesus of realizing I'm past my pay grade here? We're talking two different languages and whatever Mary learned in Luke 10, there's something she has learned and she has developed what I call living in the same frequency of Jesus. Living in the same frequency of Jesus because this is what happens. I need you to hear this. When you sit at his feet, his word is his frequency. Most of us live on AM trying to connect to FM. The Bible gets you into FM. So look at this. She says, he's looking for you. And I, I can just feel it in this room. There are some Marys who have been cultivating secret histories with God. Men and women in this room, you've cultivated a life in secret. And Jesus tells us, he who sees in secret will reward you openly. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Go with me to verse 32, quickly. Mary's going to come where Jesus was, see him, and where's she at, saints? At his feet. Mary's always at the feet. And she's going to say, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. How can you say the exact same prayer as Martha and yet provoke two different responses in Jesus? It's not about having right words, people. Matter of fact, the, the longer that my prayer life goes, the shorter my prayers get. It gets deeper and shorter and words like help mean a lot. I need you. It's not a lot. It's not big verbiage. It's not articulate praying and saying it right. It's I need help, help. And I find that the shorter it goes, the deeper it provokes something in God. When she says it weeping, see, cause she's not saying it as an accusation. I believe she's saying it. You know, faith isn't living over here in a, a fake hallelujah or over here in a deep depression. Real faith is I know who you are, but I don't know how to reconcile while you haven't broken in yet. And I'm not getting out of the tension until you break in. Now get with me right now, I'm gonna speed this up. He saw her weeping. Jews who came with her weeping. Look at how he responded. He got in theological talks with Martha. When Mary does it, he groaned in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit. What did that look like, sound like? For Jesus to groan in the spirit. And now he's awakened and he was troubled and he says, where have you laid him? 
Now he's moving into activity and they said, come and see. And then we see the longest verse in the Bible. Some may call it the shortest. I'm convinced it was 30 minutes of the deep, guttural, snot-filled weeping and sobbing of the Son of God who for a short moment in time came and joined hands in the brokenness of humanity in need of a deliverance and a breakthrough. And he came and absorbed us into himself and the Son of God felt and he wept and he cried. I believe it. I'm saying it to our men this weekend. I'm saying it to our women. God is breaking off hardness of heart in this season. He's breaking off jadedness. He's breaking off religious facades and plastic personas. And vulnerability is coming to the church. And most of us just think, be vulnerable with our brothers. You won't be vulnerable with God until you let the vulnerability of God crack through your hard areas. Everybody's saying vulnerability, vulnerability. We can do it with Bobby and Susie. Who can do it with God? Pouring out your heart, he wept. And they had tons of commentary about his weeping. Keep going with me. Verse 38. And then Jesus, again, groaning in himself. He's still groaning and he came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone lay against it. He said, take away the stone. And now we get to see how faith-filled Martha really is. She said, Lord, let's get practical. He stinks. You made big statements 10 verses ago, honey. Where's all that bravado at? Actually, I didn't mean it. I just knew what to say to think that would work. That's what I read in that book. That's what I read on that, po- that's what I heard on that podcast. Say this prayer and your life unlocks. Say it this way, use that formula. See, she was living through a formula and Jesus was looking for a cry. And the formula protects us from the pain of dealing with God that just does things outside the boxes. All right, you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna yell at a tomb and call a man forward. And a man who's been dead for four days is going to walk out of a grave because Jesus spoke to a grave. I wanna tell you something right now. Who's in need of resurrection in your life? Come on, raise your hand all over this room. Who's in need of a resurrection in your life? I want you to stand right now. If you just raise your hand, I want you to stand. Tears are the seedbed for resurrection. And I believe with all my heart, stones are being rolled away and the Son of God, who is the resurrection, is speaking through your mouth resurrection to your children, to your finances, to marriages, to circumstances. There's been so much estrangement. Families have been divided. There are many in this room have been divided from families over situations. Things have gotten nasty in the midst of wills being drawn out. And I believe resurrection is coming. I just want to ask everybody to stand right now. I want to just... He is, he is using this season to produce a new prayer on the inside of you. And he's saying, honey, I can stay here all day long. I can stay here for as long as you need to. I just refuse to relate to you in plastic. I'm not gonna relate through facades. I want you to reach I want you to believe and and live in tension and not just resort to cookie cutter answers. I want you to wrestle things out with me. Some of you have been medicating your pain with substances, relationships. And I believe that the Lord is wanting to rip the bandaid off and awaken a cry. 
Come Holy Spirit, I pray all over this room. Whatever you taught Mary, I pray that you would teach us today. She would begin a journey with each and every one of us. Let's just have the worship team come out here. Uh, awaken tears. I pray that you would release the gift of tears to this family. I pray that you would release the gift of tears to this family. The weeping God is imparting the gift of tears to the church. Uh. I wasn't able to go into it this morning, but in the next story of Mary, she's gonna take oil. And because of an act of worship, it's gonna be carried all around the world whenever the gospel is preached. I need you to understand what you're walking through right now is about the glory of God going everywhere out of your life because of this breakthrough. He's not gonna stay in the grave. This situation is not gonna stay in the grave. It's under resurrection. Ah. God, I pray that you would awaken the one thing in the heart of this people. That we would become a people of one thing. God, deliver us from distraction. Deliver us from busyness and worry and anxiety that's crippling our souls. Forgive us for becoming masters of everything while neglecting the one thing. Teach us how to wait before you, God. Yeah. Yeah. Come Holy Spirit, I pray that you would mark your people all over this room. I really feel like if there are people in this room today, God's hitting you at another level. This is just the word for right now. I need you to come forward. I think there's a response necessary. I wanna invite you up all over the room right now. This word is for you right now. I want you to come up here. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would meet us today. Pour out your heart to God like water.